Hi, we're at the Thomas Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford, visiting with the director of the museum, Max Airy, and he's going to take us on a quick tour of the renovations of the museum and give us some details about what's to come. Excited. Thanks for being here today, Philip. Uh, this is the most, uh, um, the largest change that's ever been made in the history of this museum and we've been working on this for about two and a half years now. You know it's interesting how much this place has grown up. It started with a, uh, a small six-foot display case in the airport here mm -hmm. uh, back in the 80s mm -hmm. and then um, in 1993 we opened really the formal museum which was just two small rooms um, in the airport that was dedicated to uh, General Stafford. And I'll never forget in 1993 when he walked in and looked at these two rooms, which is probably half the size of this lobby, and he said, I never thought I'd ever see a museum of this size with my name on it. <laughs> well, nice. five editions later, well, actually now six editions later, we now have an acre and a half under roof. And um, as, he, as Tom told me one day, he said, I think we've kind of grown up. <laughs> and so Very you're good. seeing the latest expansion, which was the largest expansion of about 20,000 feet, mm -hmm. uh, square feet. And now we're starting to renovate the, the ex original building that was more than 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And the lobby where we're standing right now, uh, you can really see that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, the, um, we're, we've done a lot of renovation in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then off to the right here, was, is a very used room. We used to call it the Apollo Room. It's now going to be called the Explorer's Room. And this is our public event space. Okay. And this allows uh, people to come in, have various public events. Last year, for instance, uh, we rented this room out to, for over 100 mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. And they range all the way from wedding receptions to funeral receptions to uh, uh, training uh, seminars for various companies around this area. Uh, to just virtually uh, birthday parties, everything. So we're really excited about this new renovation and it's, uh, it's gonna really bring us up in, in capabilities of what we can do and the groups that we can handle, uh, temporary shows, exhibitions, uh, speakers, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So, um, well, it's impressive too because it's the, one of the first things you see. Yes, that's exactly it. But what also one of the first things we saw was this amazing parking lot well, renovation. That's you know, incredible out here. You know, in building, in building construction and when you do fundraising, uh -huh. the hardest things to fundraise for are for parking lots and bathrooms. Because <laughs> who wants I to see. put their name on them type of thing. Right. But they're critical. Mm -hmm. And we had to add both. We had to add additional new restrooms and then the parking lot. We went from having 16 parking places that we wow. constantly were having issues with groups here and you'd end up seeing them parked all the way up Logan Road or all the way up uh, uh, Cobb Road here. Right. And it was very inconvenient for people. We've gone from 16 parking places now to about 140. Mm. And so this will allow us to deal with most of the size groups that we'll have. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a major um, issue plus a drainage issue we had we had to fix. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it gives us, uh, it, it's, if you'd see pictures of this area out here six or seven years ago, it was terrible. Huge big power lines, right. uh, big sticker patches out here. These aircraft weren't here. Our, the one aircraft that was here was just sitting in a sticker patch, you know. Uh -huh. And so we've completely spruced this all up, all new landscaping, and now it's, right. and of course with the F-104 going up, which has become very iconic symbol uh -huh. now of the museum, we're seeing used uh, in a lot of media and so on. They, that's the one thing they go to is this right. F-104 aircraft mm -hmm. going straight up out here. And so anyhow, uh, you'll see the, see this right off. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll have we still have exhibits to go in, a big donor board, membership boards, mm -hmm. and several other exhibits to go in here. Plus, uh, we're still missing about half of the lighting. Mm -hmm. So this will be a nice dramatic entrance and welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's almost as if the museum it's begins not only the... NASA's history, mm -hmm. but all of a, a lot of the Air Force history and mm -hmm. his Air Force record is as spectacular as his NASA record was, but most people don't know much about it right. because much of what he did on the Air Force side was done under top secret mm -hmm. uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, le leveling. And so right. a lot of people don't know, for instance, that he's known as the father of stealth technology. Mm -hmm. um, he was the commander of the infamous Area 51, where mm -hmm. all the super, as he puts it, above top secret things happened. Right. Uh, that's during that time is when the F-117 uh, stealth fighter came about and the B-2 bomber and those are his babies. Yeah. And shortly yeah. we will, uh, probably in the next year, we will have an actual F-117 stealth fighter mm -hmm. setting in one of our new galleries. And so yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting things this coming This used out. to be a courtyard and we had mm -hmm. trees and shrubs and it, it was very nice except we couldn't use it very much and we were having various Mm -hmm. uh, leak problems in the building because of it and mm -hmm. and uh, so on. So this has become our new gift shop and it's expanded and of course this is very important to us from a financial standpoint mm -hmm. and um, so this will give us many more opportunities. The whole yeah. front desk area, uh, ticket counter is being changed. Mm -hmm. We've added new offices back in what was the old gift shop back uh -huh. here and that's something we desperately needed to mm -hmm. or offices because there was never ever an official office built here. So we were working out of uh, janitorial rooms, out mm -hmm. of storage rooms, anything mm -hmm. we could find to put a desk in yeah. before. So yeah. now to have <clears throat> real offices is gonna yeah, be a, a real luxury to us. Yeah, looks amazing. Let's keep going this way and we'll go. The okay. windows, uh, we designed them to I image or mirror uh -huh. the shape of the nose of the F-117. Uh -huh. And so it'll set right in here and it'll take most of this room up. Wow. Uh, so it's a big aircraft and um, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, challenges involved with it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, all of the F-117s um, are setting out in a top secret facility in Tonopah, Nevada. Mm. And they have to go through a demilling process for, by the military. Obviously they don't want an aircraft sitting out here that, um, that could ever be flown again or that Right. Uh, Has that. Th there's still a variety of top purpose. secret aspects to it. So demilling it, they take off any of the surfaces like the leading edges and so on that have top secret coatings and so on. Mm -hmm. So when that aircraft arrives, we'll have various parts and pieces missing off of it mm -hmm. that we then will have to rebuild and put on. So it still okay. has to go through a, a uh, restoration effect. Right. We'll have a variety of other um, objects in here, but this will generally, this room will be generally dedicated to stealth technology. Uh -huh. And uh, General Stafford took stealth from a theoretical into an actual usable product. And right. of course it's completely revolutionized all warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and he had a great deal to do with getting that started. Yeah. And so we really want to highlight that in here. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, in Impressive. the short term, until we get the F-117, it'll be about a year, mm -hmm. we will uh, bring in some temporary exhibits for this room, mm -hmm. and we'll have some special events in here. It's just a great mm -hmm. room. Yeah, it is. And Very so nice. uh, uh, this, well we're excited done. about this one. Yeah. yeah. Well done. It truly was. We had probably more of the old astronauts here at mm -hmm. one time. Mm -hmm. than any other groups ever done. Right. And, uh, Apollo. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty neat for a little town of weather. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's incredible to experience it. Yeah, this sure. This gallery um, will be dedicated to the space shuttle program. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chickasaw Indian Nation provided this gallery to us, and we're very excited about that. You know, it just shows, I think, the importance of this museum uh, in the minds of a lot of people in the state. Mm -hmm. The Chickasaws, who have been so giving to the state, but of course they're kind of from the southern and eastern part of the state, giving a large amount of money to a group in western Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And that makes us feel very good, but also a lot of responsibility that we have to make sure we fulfill their, their right. hopes. This will be one of the finest exhibits of, uh, on the space shuttle program uh, in display. We have some magnificent big artifacts that will go in here, mm -hmm. uh, including the actual uh, fixed base shuttle simulator that was at the Johnson Space Center for 30 mm -hmm. years and all 135 shuttle crews did their primary training nice. in this simulator. Uh, but we have uh, you know a shuttle main engine, this big mm -hmm. cylinder back here which we've had for a while, we've just repositioned it. Mm -hmm. This is a segment of a space shuttle solid rocket booster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just only a small section of one of them. This one's flown in space uh, seven times. 
recovered and reused. And like before, you will walk through the, the solid rocket mm -hmm. booster tube here, mm -hmm. and coming from Apollo, you'll walk through here, and this will be your entrance into the shuttle gallery. Nice. This will be uh, also in name of, uh, uh, of the first Native American to fly in space, who was Chickasaw John Harrington. Oh, and is that so the connection with the tribes? That's, that's, they that's were also a connection, interested. right. And yeah. John being, of course, an Oklahoman, uh, Oklahoma Chickasaw, uh, and um, that's pretty distinctive, you know, the first Native American to fly. Uh -huh. And so we'll have some of John's great artifacts that mm -hmm. he, he carried, uh, mm -hmm. Indian-related yeah. artifacts that he carried. Very and good. so setting in California now for about a year or more, a full-scale lunar module, the okay. type of spacecraft that they landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. It will obviously set right over here. We'll have it delivered in a couple of weeks. It's been held up because of the coronavirus. Uh -huh. uh, it's hard to imagine the size of this thing. It'll completely fill this whole corner, and it goes two and a half stories tall. And that's the spacecraft that Tom was the first to fly mm -hmm. uh, into the lunar environment, along with Gene Cernan. Mm -hmm. And then hanging up here, up high in here, will be the other, the mothership of the Apollo. Uh -huh. And it's the Apollo Command and Service Module that we have here. Uh -huh. So this will be one of the few displays in the world of all three of the modules of the spacecraft that flew to the moon. The Command, Service Module, and Lunar Module be right here. And so this will be a lunar landscape with the astronauts on the surface, one of the astronauts coming down the ladder, and uh, it, it'll be spectacular. Uh, and so this will be, uh, this is the second part actually of the Apollo gallery. Uh -huh. um, we have a area behind here of, uh, for uh, smaller artifacts. We call this area Gene's Corner. Yeah, and it's so are you, be, are you moving the moon rock in here? Uh, <laughs> Close a, to the there's actual. A very, there's a good chance we will be. <laughs> but awesome. uh, this has a great story behind it, this little room. This will be a lot more intimate space coming out of this high bay into this space. Uh -huh. There'll be hundreds of flown artifacts from the Apollo program in here. But Gene Cernan, one of the last times I saw Gene, uh, he passed away two years ago. Uh -huh. Gene was a dear friend. And uh, he, uh, I think, was always envious of Tom uh, as many of the astronauts were, because not only did Tom have an airport named after him, uh -huh. but he also had a museum named yeah. for him. And there yeah. were very few of the astronauts that did. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Gene flew three missions. Uh -huh. His last one, he was the last man to walk on the moon, but two of his three missions were with Tom Stafford as his commander. Uh -huh. So there was a very close bond there. They were both the, the brothers that the other one never had, you know, uh -huh. very close yes. bond. Yes. And one of the last times I saw Gene, he came up and put his arm around me and he said, Max, do you ever think that Tom would give me a little corner in this museum? <laughs> so this is Gene's this is corner. It. This is it. <laughs> and awesome. we're going to talk about that close brotherhood and how, yeah. how they became so close together and uh, uh, flew missions together. Uh, some very dangerous situations that could have easily cost both of them their lives. Mm -hmm. And that drama, that'll play out. Some of Gene's collection will be in mm -hmm. here, and of course a lot of the smaller artifacts that some of them are extraordinary. What type of things would those well, be? Well, they range all the way from parts and pieces of, of flown Apollos that have mm -hmm. been to the moon, mm -hmm. uh, some very r rocket engines. We have the, the main hatch door of Tom's Apollo 10 command mm -hmm. module, uh, mm -hmm. Charlie Brown. The front okay. door of Charlie Brown, we actually uh -huh. have it here from the Smithsonian. Uh, we have uh, parts and pieces like a docking probe and drogue that allowed mm -hmm. them to rendezvous and dock between the two spacecraft, the mm -hmm. LIM lunar module and the command module. We have one of the only ones left in the world here uh -huh. uh, that'll be on display. Um, we even, I think, we also have some really fun personal artifacts. We have Neil Armstrong's childhood teddy bear mm -hmm. that we obtained yeah. from his family. Yeah. Uh, we have a variety of things that the Armstrong family have given mm -hmm. us. And so it's just a lot of fun little things, but also yeah. very historic aspects to say, these yeah. things have actually not only flown into space, have been on the moon. Yeah. And probably one of the best collections that'll be on display, probably outside of the Smithsonian. Yeah, amazing, incredible. Yeah. So it, it, do you ever? A lot of people, again, don't realize Tom Stafford 
brought the Phoenix characters into the NASA family right. with the flight of Apollo 10. Uh -huh. the, uh, because there were two spacecraft used in the mission uh, in Apollo, they had to give them call signs. Uh -huh. And so Tom chose to call uh -huh. the command module Charlie Brown uh -huh. and the lunar module, the first lunar module that went to the moon was called Snoopy. Uh -huh. Since then, NASA has adopted, especially Snoopy, as somewhat their unofficial mascot. And mm -hmm. during all the 50th anniversary of the lunar flights, Snoopy was NASA's official mascot during all of that. Yeah. And to this day, yeah. one of the highest awards that a contractor to NASA can receive is called the Silver Snoopy Award. Mm -hmm. So there's great legacy there. But I this know. statue uh, is a great backstory to it. Um, I had seen these down at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center about 15 mm -hmm. years ago. They had several of them made up. Mm -hmm. And it was a big deal because they had the, the, the group that runs the Visitor Center had to go through a lot of legal action, had to get with the Schultz family to get permission, uh -huh. had to go to United Features who have all of their copyrights. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a big deal to get these done, but mm -hmm. I always wanted one. Mm -hmm. Last year, and I told Tom that, and last year, uh, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 10 and Apollo 11, Tom ran across Mrs. Schultz. Uh -huh. She is still living. Right. Uh, Charles Schultz passed away several years ago. Right. But uh, so they rekindled their old friendship, mm -hmm. and Tom said, I'm going to have the director of the museum call you with an idea. So I called her up, wonderful lady, uh, and uh, we had a w great talk, and I said, we would what's the chances of us being able to get one of these Snoopies here? Uh -huh. Because it's set next to the lunar module, the kids sure. will love it. And she laughed and she said, not only can I assure you you can get one, I'll pay for half of it uh -huh. if oh, nice. you'll find the other donor. Uh -huh. And it was about $20,000. So uh -huh. she was able, to, willing to put up 10000 if we could find the other $10,000. This last summer when we had the Apollo 10 50th anniversary, a gentleman walked in, an invited guest walked in that was a good friend of both mine and Tom's, and it was just like a brick right before, right uh -huh. between the eyes, and I said, this is our other donor. <laughs> so I went over and talked to him, mm -hmm. told him Mrs. Schultz was willing to pay for half of it, and I said, would you be willing to come up with the other half? He said, absolutely. And the reason he stuck out is his name is Charlie Brown. Uh, he yeah. lives in Dallas, so Charlie Brown and uh -huh. Mrs. Schultz have hooked up to get a Snoopy. <laughs> and, that's uh, excellent. So, and I got yeah. this will be setting over in the Apollo area, and I know the kids will love it. Oh, I have their pictures were, taken with the it. The kids, so. I love. This was my childhood. <laughs> I re remember it vividly <laughs> of making, doing the first rendezvous in space. But there's a lot of great stories uh, about Jim and I, uh, and you can look inside and see how small it was for one mm. thing. Uh, and imagine setting in here in two big bulky spacesuits. Mm -hmm. There's not enough leg room to stretch your legs out. They had to sit in mm -hmm. there with their feet crossed each other. Mm -hmm. When you shut the hatch, it literally hit the top of the helmet. And in the case of Tom Stafford, he was the tallest uh -huh. of the Gemini astronauts. He was right at six foot. And when he was laying on the launch pad, his torso would stretch a little bit. Uh -huh. And when they'd shut that hatch, it would slam his head down. And so wow. you can see on Gemini 6, there's a little white square on that hatch door uh -huh. over there. And that's a little fiberglass insert that gave just enough, they put in there for Stafford, just to give him enough clearance to clear his helmet. And that's Amazing. called the Stafford bump. <laughs> but the, <laughs> but just stories of being crowded in here, and in the case of like uh, Gemini 7 that they rendezvoused with, they, uh -huh. they were up there for two weeks inside this tiny spacecraft. And then you add the personal stories, like the second day out on a two-week flight on Gemini uh -huh. 7, um, a freshly, freshly used urine collection bag split open, flooded uh -huh. the whole cockpit. Uh -huh. Well, that's horrible, but, yeah. it, but it's, <laughs> it's something people but can all identify coming. with. That would be terrible. Yeah. And uh, it, it was a really, really a dangerous situation. It was terrible, and after two weeks, I guess when they opened up the, the spacecraft, the, the uh -huh. uh, frogmen who were in the water getting them out, they opened up the hatch and they said the smell was unbelievable, yeah. <laughs> how bad it was. I but these were special people. How could anybody, I don't understand, I couldn't do that. Oh, most people, and Tom uh, Stafford, he flew two Gemini flights and he said fortunately his longest flight was only two days because he uh -huh. didn't think he could have done the right. two weeks in here. Right. And uh, so, but on wow. the back of this, uh, this is the other thing we want to do. <clears throat> Mm. There's a very direct connection between art and science mm -hmm. that often is not made. And mm -hmm. when engineers 
sit down and design airplanes or spacecraft. They design them to perform certain aerodynamic functions. Mm -hmm. Those aerodynamic functions are being uh, created by the laws of nature. They have to overcome those laws of nature. Mm -hmm. So art and science work very close together. This is a pr prime example. This is the rear end, the heat shield of mm -hmm. Gemini 6. And this tells a whole story. It's a, it, first of all, I think it's a wonderful piece of artwork mm -hmm. by itself. But this is what per kept them from burning up on reentry is this mm -hmm. round circle. And you can see the burn pattern as they came back in through the atmosphere in a fireball that was over 3,500 degrees. Wow. And that fireball stretched back about a half a mile, uh -huh. and they were inside of that. Uh -huh. And this little heat shield uh, was burning away to protect them. And uh, you see these holes in them. Mm -hmm. After every flight, they took what they called core samples because okay. they wanted to know how far into the heat shield it had burned. Uh -huh. Because anything that was left over was extra weight. Mm. And so every flight, they shaved this heat shield down a little further, a little mm. further to make it lighter. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got to the last flight, Gemini 12, there was only an eighth of an inch of that heat shield protecting them from 3,500 degrees. So what created that fireball? What's well, it was it was aspect? The, from a scientific standpoint, you're going 17,000 miles an hour, and there a spacecraft of this size at 17,000 miles an hour in orbit mm -hmm. has a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. You've got to get back down to Earth to zero miles an hour, mm -hmm. and you've got to get rid of a lot of energy to do that. In mm -hmm. this case, they did it in the form of heat, mm -hmm. because they came through the atmosphere. They used the atmosphere to break, mm -hmm. uh, slow their speed, mm -hmm. and it was pure friction that slowed them down. And that friction, just like putting your hands together and rubbing them, mm -hmm. creates an incredible amount of heat, in this case 3,500 degrees. But that's how they got rid of the energy uh -huh. to get back down to zero miles an hour. Wow. And in the case of um, the Apollo, Tom uh, and his mm -hmm. Apollo 10 crew, when they came back from the moon, they slammed into the atmosphere at over 25, or at nearly 25,000 miles an hour. Uh -huh. And uh, he, Tom, holds kind of one of the ultimate records. He and his Apollo 10 crew uh, hold the record for the fastest speed any human has ever traveled at mm. 24,791 miles an hour. Mm. That's seven miles a second when they slammed into the atmosphere and in a matter of minutes had to slow down to zero. Right. And so uh, there was a lot of energy that had to be. In fact, an Apollo slamming into the atmosphere in the course of about five minutes they generated more energy having to get rid of it as heat, had to get rid of more energy mm -hmm. than what it would take to light the entire city of Los Angeles for five minutes. Wow. They had to get rid of that. That's amazing. And so uh, that's why mm. these heat shields look the way they do, but that's mm -hmm. what these guys were setting inside of, these big fireballs. It took special people to do that. Right. And the right. G-forces that were, most of us would have passed out uh -huh. easily in, and they loved it. They were just yeah. special people. <laughs> <laughs> you would have had to be. Well, I, before I The world's forget. largest rocket engine behind us. This uh -huh. five of these were what powered the Saturn V rockets to the okay. moon. And Tom Stafford's rode mm -hmm. these before. It, it, what it does is it gives an indication of what the human mind can mm -hmm. design and build that seem mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. To get the astronauts to the moon, the amount of power it took to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth is just mm -hmm. un. You can't get your arms around mm -hmm. it. Five of these engines right here on liftoff generated the equivalent of about 176 million horsepower. Mm -hmm. That is more than twice of what you could get if you dammed up every stream and river on the North American continent mm -hmm. coming out of five of these engines. Mm -hmm. uh, each engine to do that had to burn a swimming pool full of fuel every mm -hmm. second. How do you wow. even pump that much liquid? And they did it 50, 55 years ago, mm -hmm. designed it with slide rules and drafting tables. Mm. And it's, it's, so, it's, it's beyond imagination. And today we're trying to do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, and the young engineers are trying to figure out how these guys did it 50 years ago mm -hmm. because they're mm -hmm. really struggling with it. Mm -hmm. And it shows what we used to be able to do and what now we become mm -hmm. too lax, too complacent, and we've lost some of that ability that we desperately need right now. Uh -huh. And so these are great examples, again, of measuring back of what we used mm -hmm. to be able to do 
And the thing is, that spirit and capability is very much still here. We just mm -hmm. got to rediscover it again. Mm -hmm. But what we're also seeing here is this is the only place you'll see this in the world. Uh -huh. We were in a dead race to the moon with the Soviets. Uh -huh. We had our big Saturn V moon rocket. They had an equally as big rocket called the N1. Uh -huh. And the only reason the Soviets didn't beat us there, or get there too, was they had problems with that rocket. And mm -hmm. one of the issues is they didn't have the level of technology we did. Mm -hmm. We were able to generate the necessary power with just five of these, mm -hmm. but they could never build an engine that big. Mm -hmm. They built engines of this size. Mm -hmm. And so the first stage of their rocket mm -hmm. had 30 of these engines on the first stage. Mm -hmm. And so if you can imagine the logistics issues of getting 30 engines all fired up, stabilized, and going at the same time, you have a few plumbing problems. Mm -hmm. And that's what they had. Mm -hmm. This is the only uh, engine from a Soviet N1 rocket on mm -hmm. display outside of the Soviet Union, or outside mm -hmm. of Russia. And there's only one on display in the town in Samora mm -hmm. that these were built. So this okay. is the only one outside. This is the only place in the world you can see the exact engines that both the Soviets and the Americans used to get to the moon. Mm -hmm. And awesome. so uh, this one took about six years to acquire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, you know, it cold hard piece of metal, but it represents a lot. And so we've got to get that story. They were the three flown shuttles were the mm -hmm. most sought after artifacts, of course, after mm -hmm. the shuttle program shut down. Uh -huh. And they went to NASA and the Smithsonian and, and one other pl uh, museum in West Coast. But after that, this was the most sought after artifact. And uh -huh. it's called the Thick Space Trainer. Uh -huh. This was down at the Johnson Space Center for 30 years. Mm -hmm. All 135 crews who flew shuttle did their primary Thick Space training in this. Uh -huh. In fact, the cue cards on the back of the seats were still there from the last crew, the mm -hmm. STS-135 crew. Mm -hmm. uh, it was left just like it, it, it had been. You have to take into account these two pieces this part here would swing around and attach to that part to make the cockpit. Uh, okay. So this is the entire upper deck cockpit. Uh -huh. There was 2,300 switches, gauges, and dials in this thing <laughs> that these people had to learn where everyone was, what they did, what order to push them in an emergency, and so on. Uh -huh. And you can see the wear and tear mm -hmm. that uh, uh, is in here. All mm -hmm. the, the DNA of every uh, shuttle astronaut that flew mm -hmm. are in here, including some that were killed. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but we plan to turn this into somewhat of an interactive display mm -hmm. in the new shuttle gallery. We'll spin the back part around to where you can walk between the fore deck and the aft mm -hmm. deck and look both sides. Mm -hmm. As you walk in, it'll trigger a deal where the lights come down, blue lights come up, all, uh -huh. of, the, all of the switches will backlight, will come on. Wow. Computers will start working just like it's in flight, uh -huh. rotating Earth through the window. And so it'll, and then there'll be touch screens that you can touch to find out what all of these 2,300 switches. So who do, do you have come in that can make that all happen? Well, we do do we that? conceptualize all of it, and uh, uh, we put it down into uh, specs and so on. And we have a couple of groups we're talking to right now that turn that into reality. Okay. But one of the things that we do here is we design all of the exhibits in house. Okay. Mm -hmm. And certain ones we'll build in-house, but mm -hmm. then when we get into the more technical and so on, we've mm -hmm. got to go outside. But we control it all from inside. Mm -hmm. That way we can control the quality and the, mm -hmm. uh, the story it's trying to tell. And, and mm -hmm. uh, part of the shuttle gallery that will have a, a big ex exhibition on the Hubble Space Telescope, the mm -hmm. greatest mm -hmm. scientific instrument mm -hmm. ever launched. Yeah. And it's now taken well over a million photos. And if mm -hmm. you've ever seen any of them, mm -hmm you can't believe these things actually exist out there in the universe. They're, they're just pieces of artwork. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, as you walk in, you'll walk through a room completely surrounded by about 30 monitors mm -hmm. with these images coming and going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then this area right back in here will be the future of human space flight Mm -hmm. where we're talking about the future. Mm -hmm. And then the space station and the, the Orion spacecraft. This area back in here will be devoted to mission control and the mm -hmm. connection of southwestern Oklahoma State and Oklahoma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, South uh, Swasu, uh, most people don't realize it. Uh, great story behind it, but we had over 20 graduates of Swasu that went down and worked mission control mm -hmm. at the heyday of the mm -hmm. space program. Mm -hmm. And some of the most famous mission controllers uh, mm -hmm. 
grew up in western Oklahoma and went to Swasu. And those stories are extraordinary. And they're legendary stories, and they're all from people mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. And so we want to tell that story and then another big exhibit on Oklahomans in space. Because mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that we have a relatively small population, mm -hmm. the role that this state has played in the history of spaceflight is unbelievable. And again, that's, that knowledge is not known by most people. You know, the, one, the most important NASA administrator, James Webb, um, who got it, who, who started us to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, President Kennedy came to Oklahoma City and recruited him from mm -hmm. Kerr-McGee. Mm -hmm. uh, and now our current NASA administrator, who's now restarting mm -hmm. the space program, is an Oklahoman, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bridenstine. Mm -hmm. uh, but in between there, um, all of the, the other people who played critical roles in spaceflight, we want to document mm -hmm. right over here mm -hmm. and make Oklahomans proud Mm -hmm. of that. Uh, Oklahomans aren't very good at telling their own story to mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we're too modest I think. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but again, most people don't realize that we're the only state out of all 50 states, we're the only state to have had an astronaut in every American manned space program. Uh -huh. How do you explain okay. that yeah. uh, from a state of the small population? Uh -huh. There's something there magical about yeah. growing up in Oklahoma that made that happen. Right. The right. explorers, the explorers mentality, mm -hmm. the, you know, taking risk, take, you know, but pushing yourself to do things. And I mean, mm -hmm. I have, I, I've often thought about our ancestors who settled out here in those early days of living mm -hmm. in dugouts and, and mm -hmm. I mean, pushing the extremes to the, the maximum and right. they survived that. Right. And it took very special people to do it. Well, that's the same stock that came up to fly yeah. trips to the moon.